Well, welcome, and uh, so glad to have you here as we continue our Read Through the Bible study group, and uh, take, we do a second week at the book of Isaiah. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Loving God, you are good, and I, I'm thankful uh, for all the ways you are at work and the ways that you are helping us as a family as a virtual family uh, through this experience draw closer to you and to each other and to just explore things uh, in a way that we might not normally do and so tonight uh, continue to do that we lift up the the prayer requests that were shared for healing um, options with doctors uh, for the situation in our world with continued struggle with covid um, may your healing be at work, and Lord, may we as your people uh, respond uh, in a way that honors each other and honors you and your design and your hope, your love for this world. So tonight, teach us, and may we draw closer uh, to all that you are in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so as I said, we're going to dive into Isaiah 40 through 66 and then uh just jump into jeremiah it is jeremiah is the longest book in the bible so we'll at least have next week uh to do more of that um but we'll finish oh christy jumped out we'll let christy back in uh we'll finish isaiah so let's review just a little bit and uh dave flesner will say this is just for you <laughs> Uh, no, this is from last week that I'm just going to review from. You guys gave me permission to do this choose your own adventure thing. And instead of going into the second half of Isaiah last week, um, I had been thinking about some other topics. And so I presented a little bit. I'm just going to uh, put a couple slides of each and uh, then we'll get uh, into the rest of Isaiah here. So first we talked about biblical justice uh, as a reminder. We've talked about this several times since uh, we've had this virtual class of what is biblical justice. And we often think of justice as punishment, but when you think of justice in the Bible and it helps you read the Bible with, with a clearer mind uh, towards what it really means, because sometimes words change their meaning over the course of time. But biblical justice, here it is, is to defend the poor and poverless, um, do justice with the afflicted and needy, uh, see that justice is done, which means in the second passage, help those who are oppressed and giving orphan their rights and defend widows. Um, he rises to have compassion on you. The Lord is a God of justice. And it, there's in with the same uh, sentences of being kind um, and compassionate. So that's more about what justice is over punishment but we tend to think of it that way this is what the lord says uh, give justice each morning to the people you judge okay well there's the word judge but what does it mean help those who've been robbed rescue them from their oppressors um, we're going to see in the second half of isaiah um, where jesus actually quotes some things that uh, resemble that as his some would say his mission statement we also had these pictures of equality, equity, and justice. Uh, that fence was a solid wood fence uh, in the equality and equity. And equality, the small one couldn't see. Equity, the small one had a box to stand on, so they all had the same view. Justice just takes out all the barriers. Um, and that's a neat thing that I got from uh, one of Drew's sermons. Then we talked about this, and we've talked about this a number of times, Old Testament violence. But I took a little different approach last night through the thing, or last week, through what we covered two weeks ago on this idea of Jewish midrash, um, where uh, Jewish scholars would, the idea of midrash is they would have different perspectives on different passages, and it wasn't necessarily black and white, one's right and one's wrong but it offers different insights of ways to look at it. And they just kind of let it all sit there. I talked about how that would be good in our political culture now to kind of understand that different perspectives have value. 
And then we've, we've wrestled with this idea of violence in the Old Testament um, over and over again in this class. Um, it's been something I've been wrestling with. So from Midrash two weeks ago, I decided to take that approach to violence. I've been sharing maybe one perspective over the last several months, um, but to look at it of how different theologians answer the question of Old Testament violence. You know, how should Christians make sense of what appears to be God commanding the Israelites to massacre entire populations or, or things that just really don't seem to resonate with who we know God in Christ to be. So here are, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to show them um, these variety of perspectives in just a list. That's all I'm going to do tonight as a review, um, but they are in last week's PowerPoint. But might there be something insightful in each of them? You know, I think of the person who touches his blind, he blindfolded and touches the different sides of an elephant, you know, that, that metaphor, that example. So here they are, and that's some options we talked about last week. So how do you deal with some of what we see in the Old Testament that just doesn't feel great? Well, one, we can reject those depictions of God uh, that are inconsistent with God as revealed in Jesus. So we can say, okay, something's different here. We got to come understand it from a different way. We can view deeper meaning of some of these Old Testament stories allegorically. And I unpacked that a little bit last week. These are different theologians uh, that have kind of come, some ancient theologians, uh, Origen and Augustine and Irenaeus and people from really close to Jesus' time came up with some of these. Uh, we can recontextualize violence within the whole story of the Bible. So it's like we, we take the Bible as a whole and how do we understand how that might have played into it. We can simply assert God's right to judge the world. God is God and God can do what God wants and God doesn't even have to be consistent. It, God is God. Um, so that's that one. And we can reinterpret the descriptions of violence to make them less confronting. Oh, you know, when those people were killed and the women and children, it sounded like they were being asked to be killed. That really wasn't what was happening kind of thing. So these are all different ways theologians have uh, put. And I didn't last week and I'm not going to this week, although I have in the past, kind of say where I've come to, where I'm coming to. Let me put it that way, not come to because it's a process. And uh but I, I'm not going to put that one out there tonight. <laughs> um, that all of these may have some value in them. And I, I'm intentional about saying where I'm coming to because I think you've heard me say as soon as I think I, I have God figured out, then I've suddenly created God in my own image. So constantly learning. And these last couple weeks, I have been trying to go outside and listen to views different from uh, what I might uh, lean towards um, because it's so easy to just get in an echo chamber and get confirmation, you know, bias and, and go to the places where you always go. So I've been trying to do some of that uh, this last week, a couple weeks. All right. And finally, last week, I talked about this thing called the God, the great allower. And that's it's it's another topic beyond Old Testament violence, but it comes out of that. Is God coercive? And this phrase comes from a, a Franciscan priest named Richard Rohr. And uh, part of what I did, this isn't Richard Rohr, this is John Hott. Last week I had David Woolert quoted on there and he corrected me. He was just repeating it from John Hott, this first part. Um, creation is what happens when omnipotence becomes humble. And so there is allowing that's happening in that. God humbled himself so that something else could actually exist. And that humbling event introduces the possibility of everything. Beauty, life, death, truth, freedom, of which suffering is also a piece. So God is a great allower. With my 20 and 21 year old kids, I'm becoming a little bit more of the parental allower. <laughs> and that includes my son who has a dent in his car and I'm not going to just fix it for him. <laughs> um, so there is maybe some of that in the character and nature of God. Uh, this is from an article who is um, responding to some of what Richard Rohr has written about um, God the Great Allower. And she said about herself, I couldn't see why God couldn't just force me into doing the right thing rather than risking that I would blow it. 
She said, it took me, took me quite some time to accept that allowing us our freedom was indeed a great gift. And then she uh, quotes Richard Rohr, who said, Rohr speaks of allowing the great allower to allow us, even at our worst. There, there's some depth in that, allowing the great allower to allow us, even at our worst. And if we do, Rohr suggests, we learn to share in the divine freedom and to forgive God sometimes for being too generous. God, how could you allow that? Um, and as we begin to allow ourselves, even at our worst parts, and, 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 and find um, hope in that, then maybe we begin to see something deeper about God. Um, I did not, I don't think I covered this last week. I feel like I'm not remembering going this, but in this God the Great Allower, my last slides were going into Romans uh, and the whole idea of God's wrath. And that's a term that's thrown out. We've talked about this before, um, but Romans makes some pretty uh, clarifying statements about what God's wrath may be, uh, may be understood as. So this is directly from Romans 1, 18 through 23. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since they since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now, I love this next verse. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. We didn't need to wait until there was prophets and, and all these other things. We've been seeing the nature of God through creation. I love that. <laughs> um, so because God is constantly revealing God's self, in many ways, we are without excuse. So God's wrath is being revealed. So what is that? So although they knew God, continuing, neither they glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Of course, he's talking about all of us. Although they claimed to be wise, we became, change it to we, fools, exchanged the glory of God of the immortal God for images that look like mortal human beings and birds, animals and reptiles. Of course, Paul is talking about a specific situation, but we can kind of do that sometimes. And then therefore God gave them over in sinful desires of their hearts. Okay, that phrase gave them over. And in the next six verses, he says it three more times. Therefore, God gave them over in sinful desires of their hearts. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of this, God gave them over. The message translation says it this way, this one at the bottom. God said, in effect, if that's what they want, that's what they'll get, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, does this help us, you know, maybe think about some ways of how to understand some of these Old Testament passages that we wrestle with? That was the whole reason I kind of went on this choose your own adventure variety of topics was how do we understand some of this really strong language? So this gets at some things with that. Um, not clear black and white answers, but it gives some perspective. Does anyone want to comment on those before we then dive back into Isaiah? Anyone want to comment on that? Dave, if you want to dive into it, I could get you the previous week's stuff. So if you want to dive into any of that anymore. I got your video and I'll listen to it. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Isaiah. So last week we talked about this first part of Isaiah. And uh, let me share again. Hold on. Share it correctly here. Okay. So... Um, I'm going to just barely cover last week, and then we're going to dive into the second half. So it's really kind of two halves of the book. There's before the exile and after the exile. Um, but just really quick, getting a setup about what Isaiah is in big picture. It's He's the first of the major prophets. The, um, the prophets are these people who are moved by the Holy Spirit to speak on God's behalf. Um, and... Isaiah is the only major prophet whose story takes place before the fall of Jerusalem. Um, and Jeremiah, as we're going to get into, prophesy about these events before and while they happen. So we'll talk about that with Jeremiah because a lot of it's while it's happening. 
But Isaiah looks into not only what's happening before, but then he kind of does this prophetic prediction kinds of things about what's going to happen afterwards as well. Um, so it's a message of warning, and there is some harsh, harsh warnings in that. And that's where we get some of the language that we were wrestling with. Um, I got some comments and emails about. But also this book of hope. Um, though Israel will face the consequences of their choices, is Isaiah's prophetic words, they're full of hope for a day when God will restore his people to himself. And I love that word restore. I should have put that, highlighted that in yellow. Um, God always working to redeem and restore, to redeem and restore. Um, sometimes I say God is the God of the perpetually half full cup. You know, we kind of get things where we get them and then God's like, all right, I can do this. I can restore this. Let me, trust me. Um, and Isaiah, and we'll talk about this today, has um, a lot of um, prophetic language that refers to uh, a Christ figure. And as Jesus came, then we saw a lot of that played out. So he didn't necessarily know probably what he was referring to, but a lot of that, as we'll see in today's uh, class, will was... Um, came to fruition in the person of Jesus, in his life, his death, and his resurrection. I love what the Bible Project called uh, what a prophet is, a covenant watchdog, in the sense of that these, this covenant promise that God has made from the beginning. Um, they hold that promise up, but say, okay, people, what is it going to look like to live into it? Uh, you're going another direction. Come on, let's get back. God wants to live into this covenant, live into this promise with us, but we've got to live into it with him. So um, that's that. Okay, you guys have talked about this slide in the past quite a bit, it's helpful. So we have this time of exile here, right at the end of 700 BC to about 600 BC. Isaiah, the book kind of takes place before the exile, and then there's these predictions that would be after the exile, and we're, um, thought to have been written by someone else in kind of uh, after they came true of what Isaiah was saying would come true um, with the Babylonian captivity and all that. But here's kind of where it takes place. I think I'll come back to this later, but Jeremiah then is, look here, right on the line of the exile, a little before and during that. So, okay. Uh, a couple more uh, before we get into a teaching video, but why did God call Israel in the first place? So this is even going before uh, Isaiah. Um, we have so much focus in the Bible on Israel, um, and it's so that all nations would find salvation and blessing. Isaiah begins with this grand vision in chapter 2 that all people and Israel be made the centerpiece of all that God does in the world. So it's not that God just chose Israel and that's all, you know, we talk about Israel as God's people and it's not that it's limited to that, but he chose Israel to um, be the reflection of God's nature, the love of God, um, what it looks like to live into um, God's love and hope and call for our lives for the rest of the world, that it would transform the world into peace and harmony. Of course, we see that you know, Israel doesn't do that over and over again. <laughs> but that's why God calls Israel in the first place. Um, here's some of the promises uh, about raising up a king in this early part of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah 2, you'll recognize this. People walking in darkness, seeing a great light. Lifted that up last week. Isaiah 9, 6. First one is 9, 2. This is 9, 6. For us, unto us a child is born, a son is given. We all recognize those from uh, our Advent season. And Isaiah 11, uh, 1 and 2, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Uh, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will uh, rest upon him. And I love these creation images here um, of the stump of Jesse, you know, in our lives. Sometimes, you know, uh, that's all that's left is a stump. But from that comes a branch and then it bears fruit and we... We've talked about the fruits of the Spirit, and we will do that again as we get in the New Testament. So 
in this first half of Isaiah, which we covered last week, then there's a lot of hard language about what's going on. Here's where you're going. The way I said it to my Sunday school class this morning, uh, but we were just talking about prophecy around Drew's sermon. Um, I said prophecy is like, you know, someone saying to a young child, don't run in the street. If you run in the street, this is going to happen. You're going towards the street. Stop going that direction. We got to do this, you know. <laughs> um, so there is some prediction of the future, but it's really more about that covenant watchdog. You're, you're not going to live the good life. You're not going to be able to do this. Stop going towards the street. So in this part of Isaiah 13 through 27, um, he is writing to uh, a variety of people. So first, judgment on other nations. So he's talking about what's going on with other nations. Then there's this promise of restoration to all nations. And then there's woe and judgment more specifically on Jerusalem. Stop running down the street, okay? Then goes back, woe to the nations and some blessing. It's that, you know, um, the warning and the hope holding those up. And this is poetic literature. We need to remember that. A lot of this is poetic. Um, and then the last part becomes narrative. And it's the story of Israel's ministry to Hezekiah. And uh, some things take a turn there. And we're going to go then into uh, 40 through 63. But after that first half, so setting us up for where we're at today, here's the questions that kind of are going through everyone's mind. What's going to happen to Yahweh's promises? Here's all these warnings. Here's all this uh, doom and gloom kind of thing. And yes, there's hope in there, but it's not here yet. Um, so what's going to happen to that? Is that still a promise? When's it going to happen? When's God going to bless the nation? And then when is God going to send this Messiah that ultimately brings justice and righteousness? And we come back to that theme of justice. All right. So here we are. So we're going to do this video again, um, where uh, this is one of the founders of the Bible Project who writes those kind of cartoony graphics that we see, the storyboard graphics, and he's doing it a little bit di different here, and I thought it was a good change of pace. So here's uh, five minutes on Isaiah 40 through 66, and then I'll see what things stood out for you and if you have any questions. Here we go. Hey there, welcome to the Bible in Five. Uh, this is part two of the book of Isaiah. So uh, you're spending about two weeks or so reading the book of Isaiah. And uh, the first half, you'll recall, just set the basic storyline uh, that's familiar from the rest of the Old Testament. So God's promise is that through Israel, he's going to somehow bring blessing and salvation to the nations. Isaiah developed that that promise was going to take place. All nations would be blessed through Israel, through sending the Messiah. But that was going to take place only after Yahweh brought a great act of justice uh, against all of the rebellious nations and an act of judgment against Israel itself for abandoning Yahweh. And so the ultimate act of judgment uh, was Israel being exiled to Babylon, uh, which took place uh, in the er early 500s, around 585 BC. And so the big question you had in the first half of Isaiah is when is the Messiah coming? How will all nations be blessed if God's people are sitting in exile? And that's uh, the big shift that takes place here in the second half of the book. And really what happens here is these chapters you're reading and the perspective of the prophet is from before the exile, before it happens. But then something changes in chapter 40. All of a sudden, the perspective of the prophet is looking back on the exile as if, as if it's already happened. It's already over. And so the opening words of chapter 40 are announcing uh, that the prophet is now supposed to comfort and bring comfort to God's people. The exile is over, which means the judgment is past. And the big question then is, wow, the events of salvation, the Messiah, blessing for all nations, that's going to happen now, right? Because the exile is over. And so what the prophet does here in these chapters is a couple, uh, a couple key things. And you really have to pay close attention to the themes that get repeated and developed in these chapters. The prophet develops this idea that Israel was being brought out of the exile. It's like another exodus. He describes coming back from Babylon like passing through the sea again, passing through the desert, and coming back into the promised land. 
And the role that Israel is supposed to play as someone who's been redeemed by Yahweh in the past in the Exodus, but also now after the exile, <clears throat> is Israel was called to be a servant, a witness to the nations of who Yahweh is and, and so on. And so in chapter 42, we're introduced to this, this figure called the servant. And at first it's unclear who this figure is. We think, well, it seems like it's supposed to be the whole nation of Israel uh, is Yahweh's servant, a witness to the nations. But as you read in these chapters, the prophet just goes after the people of Israel. They're still rebellious. They still worship idols. And so they disqualify themselves from actually being the servant who will bring Yahweh's blessing and justice to the nations, like was talked about in chapter 2 and so on. And so what I've highlighted here are what are called the key servant passages. In 42, it's ambiguous who the servant is. But as you go on in other key passages in 49, you learn that the servant is not going to be the people of Israel. It's going to be an individual. And actually, the language used to describe the servant is the same language used to describe the messianic king from chapters earlier in the book of Isaiah. So in other words, here's what, what the prophet is doing. The prophet is saying Israel as a whole nation was called to be a servant to the nations, but they failed. So Yahweh is going to raise up another servant, Israel's Messiah King, who will take up the role of being uh, the one who will bring blessing and salvation to all of the nations. And how is the servant going to do that? And this is the shocking, crazy idea that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah puts uh, into the Old Testament, is that the Messiah is going to save and bring blessing to the nations, by chapter 53 here, by dying, by being murdered and giving up his life, and somehow the death of the servant is going to be like a sacrifice, a sacrifice from the book of Leviticus to atone for sins and to provide atonement for Israel's sins, but also the whole world. It's a, it's a, it's a, this is a shocking new development of uh, the storyline of the Old Testament, that the Messiah is going to die on behalf of Israel and the nations. And so what happens from here, Isaiah develops uh, this theme then uh, he in introduces the figure of the servant once more, that the servant's going to bring a, a good news. This is in chapter uh, 61. Jesus quotes these words uh, at his opening sermon in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. He takes up the role of the servant as applying to himself. So what the prophet does in these latter chapters here is he's still going back and forth between bringing uh, words of judgment against uh, the people, but also keeping uh, in, in uh, the people's view the hope and the promise of the coming Messiah uh, who will bring blessing to Israel and to all nations. So the book uh, kind of comes to its climactic point here in the last two chapters with this grand vision that when Yahweh does bring salvation and blessing for all nations through the servant, it will uh, result in what Isaiah calls a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth when God will come back to restore peace and justice uh, for all nations, just like uh, he promised here in these chapters. Uh, and it comes to a grand kind of culmination of a world in which there is no suffering, no war, no hardship, but the Messiah uh, uh, ruling in this new creation over a restored humanity. So it's, I mean, it's a grand vision. It's the whole storyline of the Bible here, wrapped up in the, book of, uh, in the book of Isaiah. So there's lots more here that we could cover, but we don't have time to. But that's the big outline of the book, and I hope that'll be helpful for you as you, uh, as you read your way through. So Isaiah, you can do it. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to come out in just a minute. I'm going to share what stood out to me, and I'd love to hear some things that stood out to you. But... I love this phrase he made, and it, it's so cool. I had not thought of Isaiah that way until I saw this, but the whole storyline of the Bible wrapped up in the book of Isaiah. And he really told that well there, um, how cool that, that was. The other thing that was cool, and I didn't pick this up the first two times I watched this video, was a few slides ago, um, I talked about why God chose Israel, right? To be this... Uh, nation through whom he could share God's self with other nations and a nation that could be then as Tim Mackey just put it the servant the one to to help others to see what this looked like when omnipotence humbles himself and to this giving and then what that looks like to live into that um, and when Israel 
uh, continued to fail to do that, then there's this uh, servant, this new servant being lifted up. And then we're going to dive into those things. It didn't look like a king that they thought it was going to look like. <laughs> Very different kinds of things. So let me come out of that before we go into all this. Anything else that stood out for you all in that video? Anything that seems significant or something you've read um, about Isaiah that seems significant? Anyone? All right. Jump in if there is. I don't have to do all the talking. Okay. So what I wanted to do for this was I wanted to jump into some of these chapters that he was talking about and just really go Sorry, my connection what what's that christy my connection's a little slow. okay i wanted to say the thing i noticed about isaiah 53 was the prediction of christ's death but that christ often referred to it in in the new testament yeah yeah so and isaiah didn't really probably know what Isaiah was, we talked about that last week, Steve made that point last week, you know, didn't really fully know what he was predicting, you know, and wasn't specifically thinking about Jesus, but um, it is interesting how all that then on this side of history, we can see how all of that came together. Um, imagine what it was like for people to hear this before the time of Christ and... Um, <laughs> You know, at times of exile and things like that, very, very different. Um, you know, I'm wrestling right now with the potential of this COVID having a second surge. I'm really wrestling with that. That's probably small potatoes compared to things they were dealing with, you know. Um, so I'm trying to uh, put myself in those shoes. So let's, let's walk through some of these things. Christy, you just mentioned Isaiah 53. This is passages right out of there. Um, so I'm just going to read some of these. Uh, some will be very familiar to you. Who believes what we've heard and seen, says Isaiah. Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. Now there's some of that... Um, you know, creation language, and if you will, uh, nature language, that stump we talked about earlier. There was nothing attractive about him. He's talking about this servant that's coming. Nothing to cause us to take a second look. Can imagine again hearing this at the time where you're in exile, you know, um, and reading that. Uh, you know, what it makes me think about uh, at the time of Jesus, the Jews, you know, were looking for a king kind of like we probably would look for, you know, a, a military king, a, a high government power king. And I kind of want to say, but they have passages like this. Why didn't they expect differently? But would I? I don't know if I was in that. Um, he was looked down on and passed over a man who suffered who knew pain firsthand. This is the one Isaiah is talking about. It's going to bring the hope. <laughs> one look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, says Isaiah. Thought he was scum, says Isaiah. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. <sighs> what a poetic, powerful passage. We thought, oh, here's a, one of my favorite parts. We thought he brought it on himself that God was punishing him for our failures. That is a, a powerful passage there. You know, as you think about when we get into the Gospels, we're going to talk about atonement. You know, why did God allow Jesus to die or why did that have to happen? And atonement theories are the midrash, if you will, of trying to figure out what all that was about. Um, but we thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped him and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He took the punishment that made us whole. 
though through his bruises we get healed we're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost we've all done our own thing gone our own way and god has piled sorry my pager is just going off and god has piled all our sins everything we've done on him on him he was beaten he was tortured but he didn't say a word these are powerful passages like a lamb taken to be slaughtered and like a sheep being sheared he took it all in silence um there's a, a song i love by a man named david wilcox who who talks about a vow of silence of how we can live into that what it looks like for us to to not always have to speak up on our behalf and defend all the time but trust something deeper this is from the message here look at this phrase justice miscarried i need to unpack that phrase um, we talked about justice what does it mean you know what we thought was justice gets miscarried here and he was let off and and did anyone really know what was happening he died without a thought for his own welfare beaten bloody for the sins of my people they buried him with the wicked threw him in a grave with a rich man even though he'd never heard a soul or said one word that wasn't true still it's what god had in mind all along to crush him with our pain so there's that great allower you know god said all right i'm going to take it upon myself uh the plan was that he gave himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it life life and more life he swallowed up death and victory okay and god's plan will deeply prosper through him out of that terrible travail of soul he'll see that it's worth it and be glad he did it though what he experienced my righteous one my servant will make many righteous ones through what he experienced as he carries the burden of their sins and therefore I'll reward him again this is Isaiah talking uh, many many years before okay the best of everything the highest honors because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch because he embraced the company of the lowest he took his own shoulders the sin of the many he took up the cause of all the black sheep I just you know I'm trying to put myself in a mindset of what that must have been like to hear it I mean I I can grasp it on this side of the cross but I, I don't know that I could have grasped it then okay then we go to Isaiah 61 now this is that passage that Tim Mackey was saying Jesus quoted so it's his first time in the temple uh, maybe not his first time because he was probably in the temple as a child but this is where he made his big first public appearance and he stood up to read the scroll and um, he read this passage the spirit of god the master is on me because god anointed me he sent me to preach the good news to the poor heal the heartbroken announce freedom to all the captives pardon the prisoners god sent me to announce the year of his grace a celebration of god's destruction of our enemies and to comfort all who mourn to care for the needs of all who mourn in zion and give them uh, bouquets of roses instead of ashes messages of joy instead of news of doom messages of joy instead of news of doom a praising heart instead of a languid spirit what does that say about justice and here jesus in luke chapter 4 if you want to know where it is um, when he's in the temple he reads this and says today this is being fulfilled um, it continues rename them oaks of righteousness this is that restoration stuff that we talk about planted by god to display god's glory they'll rebuild old ruins for me that's that cup always half full and god will restore raise a new city out of the wreckage beauty from ashes we just read they'll start over on the ruined cities take the rubble left behind and make it new from the rubble left behind um, beauty from ashes again going back to that the way i have a shirt that says god never wastes pain um, and so it's like uh, this restoration thing that happens you'll hire outsiders to herd your flocks and foreigners to work your fields hmm that's an interesting line but you'll have the title priests of God honors as ministers of God and when we get into what 
book is it? In the, one of the epistles in the New Testament, it's called, and John Wesley's big on this, we are the priesthood of all believers, but we're seeing it here already in the Old Testament, priests of God. Uh, and then Isaiah 65, walking through these passages he was highlighting in that video. So pay close attention now. I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. All of the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I'm creating. I'll create Jerusalem as sheer joy. Create my people as pure delight. I'll take joy in Jerusalem. Take my delight in people. No more sounds of weeping. No cries of anguish. No more babies dying in the cradle or old people who don't enjoy a full lifetime. 100th birthdays will be considered normal. <laughs> Anything less seem like a cheat. This is from the message translation. But again, Isaiah, this is how he's ending this book of warning. Um, there's this new way that's unexpected. And then, okay, here's what we still have to hope for. Because this is not fulfilled yet. Um, we see the beginning of the fulfillment of it, but it's not fulfilled yet. Build houses and move in. I'm going to go a little faster on this one. Go down to the bottom. They themselves are plantings. There's that creation thing again. Blessed by God with their children and grandchildren. Likewise, God blessed. Okay. Before they call out an answer, before they finish speaking, I'll have heard. I love that wolf and lamb will graze in the same meadow. <laughs> For me, that says no us and them. David, you'll appreciate. I was just listening to a song. I forget who it's by, but there is no us and them. Um, I should have played that tonight. We'll get into that theme again. All right. So before we go into Jeremiah, any thoughts on all of that? That's more of maybe reading of passages than I've done before, but I was glad to be able to do that. I was thinking at the listening to I listened to this in Isaiah it was just nice to hear all those passages that are in Handel's Messiah yes. uh, a lot of those uh, passages are what we sing uh, you know especially at Christmas uh, times of year and just to read the full context of the passage was really great and hear the music in the background <laughs> yes I love it yeah I, I just really am struck about what would that have been like to hear that then Again, we have the hindsight 2020, but what would it have been like? We don't have full hindsight 2020 because not all of that's come yet. I, I love to listen to Handel's Messiah myself. Yeah, it's beautiful. Anyone else? Yeah, my, I have to admit, my, uh, my brain got distracted during a lot of that because I <clears throat> was thinking back earlier when we were talking about the stump and the thing growing out and somehow my brain immediately shifted to the children's book, The Giving Tree. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of hearing a lot of that as almost a parallel to some of that story. And in The Giving, I don't know if everybody here is familiar with that children's book, but it's a profound <clears throat> children's book by Shel Silverstein. And in that book, the tree just keeps giving, giving fruit, giving wood, giving branches, and this guy keeps chopping things off and building a boat out of it, this, that, and the other. And eventually there's nothing but a stump left. And it's like the tree's given everything it can give, sacrificially, canonically, and the guy comes back at the end and he's tired and worn down and he just wants a place to sit. And the stump is like, oh, well, you know, I, I can provide that too. And the guy sits on the stump and the, the book kind of ends there. The tree is happy because it got to do something for this person one last time. And in my mind, I was thinking, you know, it'd been interesting in that book if you turn the page and the guy's sitting there and you just see a little sprout starting to grow wow. out of that stump. Yeah. That's where my head went. So I, I, I appreciate that. And it was all about relationship in that book, right? And that giving was about relationship yeah that would be cool to see that um and this isaiah kind of says that right you know it's kind of that same message with the next uh the next possibility tom you were going to say something i had a question when i was young my father told me that uh jewish 
people, let's just say Orthodox Jews, who are looking forward to the Messiah, like the Messiah might come. And I've never been clear if that was true or not. So that's that's a question. Like, do Orthodox Jews look forward to a person Messiah since they don't think Jesus was that? Yeah, I'm writing this down. What would modern Orthodox Jews say they're looking for, right? Yeah, or are they looking for a person Messiah? Yeah, okay. Part of the um, Testament. So. That reminds me, so this week, as I, I think I know where I'm going to go for our time's sake, but I had... I have four videos, which I knew I wasn't gonna, I was gonna pick one of them, and I don't even think I'll get to one of them tonight. Um, but I had four videos for Jeremiah. While we were driving to Georgia yesterday, I just had the videos playing in the audio, you know, so I was listening to the audio in the car and um, was listening to all about Jeremiah, big picture stuff yesterday, it was really good. And I found, I had I'd done a search on YouTube for Bible Project Jeremiah thinking I would find, you know, some further stuff like we just watched. And something came up, but it was a different Bible Project logo. I thought it was actually going to be them. And, I, and it was like 20 minutes, and it had two things on Jeremiah. And the second one, Tom, why I'm going here, was a Jewish perspective of Jeremiah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's cool. So as I'm listening to it, it's a podcast, and I'll tell you where from in a minute but they brought on a rabbi and asked him to give his perspective on that. So we might have to do that with this question that you're asking. I might have to try to find a rabbi I can talk to, but here's the, the thing I was gonna to announce tonight. It was not the Bible project that we've been following. It was Hyde Park United Methodist Church in the year of 2020 while, well, they started it before COVID and the lockdown, but they did what we're doing this year in 2020, reading through the Bible. And then when it went locked down, the staff each week created a 20 minute or so podcast on that week's readings. And they are good. Now they're all out there. So um, I am going to uh, be using some of that now and I'll be sharing that with you in the email. But I thought that was pretty cool to have another Methodist church do this just a year before and I like their approach where they brought on special guests. So, Tom, maybe we'll have to figure out how to do that <laughs> for that question, because that would help us. That would help put us back in that frame of mind. You know, what were they thinking they were looking for? Tom, were you going to say something have, else? Jim, you've made uh, or will have made 50 <laughs> to 60 minute podcasts. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. It makes me want to, well, we've had some great conversation, but yeah, they were good. All right. I think here's what I want to do because we're sitting at seven now. So I don't think I'm going to show any of those videos. I think I'm going to go to a side topic on Jeremiah. Okay. So I'm not even going to intro Jeremiah. We'll get to that. We actually, according to the calendar, we have two weeks, we, two more weeks we could cover because Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible. So we'll have time to cover it, but I want to do something. I saw a video um on this i'm not showing it but i'm going to kind of sum it up how many of you have heard of the passage jeremiah 29 11 and when i say that know it so jenny's going yeah can anyone repeat it ready jenny off the top of your head you ready Pop is that quiz. the one that says for i know the plans i have for you for Keep welfare going. not for yeah yeah for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans um, for hope and a future, plans to prosper you, okay? And a lot of people uh, quote that out of context. And so I wanted to just take a little tangent. Let me go to my slides on it. I'm going to have to go way down for a minute, though. Uh, hold on a sec. Let me escape out of here and go way down to it past all these videos, Jeremiah 29, 11. So let me come back up to this one uh, just for a closer today and kind of share what I've, I've put. Um, there's some good video. There was an eight minute one. I'll put 
that one in the uh, email, but I'm just going to share this as written. Uh, contains a precious promise held dear by Christians. I love this passage. It's also likely one of the most misapplied verses of all of Scripture. So this helps us in that reading of Scripture. In this one, in this verse, Jeremiah affirms that God is in control, and moreover, He has good things in store. Well, we know that we've been talking about that with our covenant, right? This covenant promise. So. Here's what Jenny just quoted. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not evil, to give you future and a hope. And some translations talk about prosper um, in there. So some have taken this verse and applied it to themselves in an unqualified way. Well, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, they say. He has mapped out the course of your life. And you only have to be obedient to him to step into his blessing. Some go further and say that this verse promises earthly prosperity, that we're not to settle for second best. We are children of the king, and in this view, suffering and deprivation signal lack of faith. I'm on the share screen, but how many of you have heard it shared that way or heard the prosperity gospel? Um, and this quote in the middle here, well, I can't go the page up. Um, you know, mapped out the course of your life only to be obedient. When I saw that quote, I thought, yeah, that's some of the theology that Job's friend had, you know, just be obedient and, and everything will work out. Some of Proverbs had, but then when we understood wisdom from different perspectives, we saw it differently. So it's very easy to take single verses out of context. So the context of Jeremiah 29, 11 indicates that it's not meant as a blanket promise of worldly blessing, but there is an incredible promise through it. So I just, just for a minute, want to walk through it, okay? So here it is. This is from Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm not doing the whole uh, chapter, but here's some of it. Um, beginning at verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. By the way, Jer uh, Jeremiah is kind of a compilation of Jeremiah's writings. So that's why it's introed that way. So Jeremiah goes on uh, in this chapter 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens. Now this is while they're in exile, right? Okay. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons, give daughters in marriage. Now that's interesting because that goes against the Deuteronomy code. It's uh, about marrying people from other uh, countries. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but marry them so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number. Do not decrease while you're in exile in Babylon. Okay. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Wait a minute. What? Okay. We're going into Babylon. We've been taken into exile. Seek the prosperity, pray for it, or pray the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. How interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming weeks. But do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams and encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. So what's happening here, a lot of other prophets, uh, they were, Jeremiah would call them false prophets, were preaching very differently than he was preaching. Here he's saying, all right, settle into this exile, settle in. And they're saying um, other things than that, which we'll go into. But now comes that passage. So when 70 years are completed, okay, when 70 years are completed, I will come to you and I'll fulfill good promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray with me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from your captivity. Okay, so here's what I heard in that. Just, it's not that, oh, do all this, God's going to prosper you. You're going to have, you know, a wife, 2.5 kids, a house with a four car garage. <laughs> um, I heard this. We often don't get over things, we get through it, okay? Now, that comes because here they are going through 70 years of this time with Babylon. 
And it doesn't just, you know, the prosper or the hope in the future doesn't just happen, we get through it. Now, where this phrase comes up for me a lot is when I'm working with people around topics of grief. And, I, and, and when someone is grieving something, I, that I often hear them say, people just tell us it's been two years now. Jenny, I know you work with grief. People are struggling with grief. I'm sure you've heard this said. And people just kind of expect us to get over it. It's been three years since we've had that loss. Get over it. Well, we don't get over grief. We get through it. And the promise is the getting through it. And if you remember last week, I shared an article that a member of our class did about kind of an ecclesiastical wisdom um, that was shared in a modern day form about people giving advice to their 20 year old self. And it kind of came out of this, you know, when you can't get out of it, get into it. Take a step in and through that, through that is where you're going to find hope and you're going to find a future and and it's through that. So then this is this is me. This is what I have tattooed right here. If you can see it. Agapate Peran Fobu, which isn't one passage, it's from a bunch, but love beyond fear. And for me, that is what Christ has done. Christ came into our captivity, walked through it to the source of our captivity, into death, defeated death, sin, and the devil, and from the inside out, uh, conquered anything that could get in the way through it. And so the hope of Jeremiah 29, 11 isn't that all of a sudden everything's going to be okay. It's that as we walk through challenges, God has gone ahead of us and we will get through it. We have hope through it. So I just thought Jeremiah 29, 11 was a kind of a fun tangent for today of verses that can easily get taken out of context and believed as this promise of this, you know, uh, transactional kind of life, uh, black and white kind of thing. So uh, I don't know what that, oh, I know what that was. Oh, what time is it? Oh, six. I think I can do that, but we'll see. Any thoughts on Jeremiah 29, 11? Has anyone kind of thought through it that way or heard it the other way? Jenny, have you had people struggling with grief say that phrase or have that feel that pressure that people say they just need to be over it? Oh, definitely the pressure of getting over it. Yeah. And not the, not that phrase, though. I, I was thinking more of some of my former students. You know, when you ask a student, what's your favorite verse? That one always pops up. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it can be this little permission giving thing, can it? You know? But we always, there's great hope in it, but it's a different kind of hope. It's not a hope free of challenges. It's a hope in the midst of challenge. So, okay, I had forgotten this last video. If no one else has something to do, I'd like to make this last video the prayer. It is a song that came on the radio this morning as I was driving to church and I was thinking about this. Would that be okay to just share a four minute song as our closing prayer? Okay. Here we go. And to close, let's read this in that context. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you hope and a future through the darkness that I have overcome. Y'all, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And next week we'll dive into Jeremiah bigger. Um, but that song made me think of our, our theme this week. So have a great week. Stay safe. And we will talk soon.